In the previous video, we uh, considered a partial Markov equilibrium model and we solved it. We know how it works. So now let's make things slightly more complicated. So now we're going to have general market equilibrium and we will just consider two commodity market models. So, look, this model is described in those six equations. So, look, what do we have over here? First equation, second equation, and third equation refers to what happens on market for commodity one. The second one refers to the market for uh, the, the second three refers to commodity two. Oh, I should probably be consistent and write it as this, but I hope you can see that it's equivalent form. Okay, let's start uh, uh, approaching this model the same way as we did before. So, this equation and this equation are equilibrium conditions, right? We know that they require the demand and supply for good one and demand and supply for good two are equal to one another. So in other words, X is demand is equal to zero. Then equation two, three, five, and six are of course behavioral equations. They are telling us how quantity demanded for good one depends on price of good one and price of good two. How supply of good one depends on quantity supply of good one. And so quantity supply of good one depends on price of good one and price of good two. And we've got the same over here. Quantity demanded of good two depends on price of good one and price of good two. Quantity supply of good two depends on price of good one and price of good two. Okay, we clearly see that things got way more complicated, but don't worry, we're gonna dissect all of the features of this model step by step. And look, even by looking at this, we clearly should be able to see what are the endogenous variables in the model. Those are quantities. Prices, right? When we will be solving this model, we will be solving it for quantities and prices. Okay, so here we've got endogenous variables. Well, everything else are exogenous variables. So A0, B0, alpha 0, beta 0 are constants. A1, A2, B1, B2, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2 are parameters. Okay, so now that we've got this, what's, what, what, what we are interested in is how uh, increase um, in the price of good one, for example, impacts quantity de demanded for good one, right? So, we can calculate this quite easily using partial derivative. If I differentiate quantity of good one with respect to price of good one, I'm going to differentiate this. When I calculate partial derivative, I assume that everything else is constant except for P1, I get that this is A1. And now look, if this is a demand function, then what A1 should be? Well, it should be negative, right? The higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded. And look, I can do the very same thing uh, for this equation. Like, to get the supply relationship of just like demand relationship in here, 
depends on the relationship between price of good one and quantity offered by companies. So if I calculate QS1 uh, proportional with respect to P1, I should get, I, sh I will get P1 and this one should be positive. Because we know from the law of supply, other things being equal, the higher the price, the more the companies are willing to produce. Okay, and look, situation changes when we move over here. Here, quantity demanded for good two should be compared to the price of good two. But again, if I calculate partial derivative, I'm sorry. This time I'm getting that this is alpha 2, it still should be negative, right? If this is a proper demand function with the higher price, that should come lower quantity. And vice versa, of course, is true for quantity supplied. If I differentiate it with respect to price 2, I will get that this is beta 2, but this one should be positive, right? And look, those values of those parameters we can take for sure, for granted. Why? Look, because those are the basic rule, rules simply taken from the law of demand and the law of supply. We're not going to negate each of them here, so it stays this way. However, I hope you can see that when, at this moment we've only considered four parameters. What about the rest? Well, here situation is getting more problematic. Of course, in this case we can assume that this one should be positive this one should be negative, uh, this one should be positive again, and this one should be negative. Well, where did I get those? Well, by analogy to what we had in our previous model, right? Look, demand, let's, let's skip this part. If price is zero, this is how much people want to buy, right? So definitely it should be positive. But here we have a situation that if we eliminate this, if price is zero, companies will definitely don't want to produce. So this should be negative, right? Just like we had, uh, 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 just like we had in the previous one. But look, at this moment, we're not going to be concentrating on these uh, on values of these parameters. Because more important uh, parameters for us are actually those that lie over. Oops, let me find some new color. Oh, yeah, something. The ones that are, that are over here, over here, over here, and over here. Hmm. Okay. So before actually. Go to, uh, 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 to to uh, figuring out what they are. Let's start by drawing the markets, the two markets, and equilibrium. Okay, so how will look market for commodity one? Well, let's just call it one, right? So we've got we need to have. X to Q, I'm just gonna call, uh, call it Q. Uh, 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 Q1, right, in this case, and here P1. I guess here the model is becoming really, really complex. Okay, so let's start with, uh, let's start with demand. And look, if price of good one is zero, then what is the quantity demanded? Well, it is A0 
right? Because price a price one is zero plus a two p two, right? And then because a one is negative, as we assumed, this is a demand quantity demanded for b one. Okay, now how how to draw a supply? Now first. Uh, we get here and that now if one if price is zero, we get that Q uh, we get that QS1 is equal to some P0 plus um, B2 P2. Okay, and from this moment on the function is increasing because B1 is positive. Okay. Now look, let's assume that equilibrium in this model exists. We will make sure that it is, but let, let, let's draw it for now already. So here we will have some equilibrium price yeah. and equilibrium quantity. Okay, now if I want to draw a market for commodity 2, I just go through exactly the same steps. So first thing I do is, now, here I will have price of good 2, here I will have quantity of good 2. Now, if price of good 2 is 0, quantity demanded of good, uh, uh, of good 2 is alpha 0 plus alpha 1 p1 and then it goes down this is quantity demanded 2 then if price of good 2 is 0 quantity supply of good 2 is b0 plus beta 1 p1 and from this point we are going up. Yeah. So here we got equilibrium price from the two, equilibrium quantity of good two. Okay, so as you see, we didn't have to use any more tricks uh, than we had before. However, Look, what happens over here is that there's one more new feature, except for the obvious fact that we have two graphs instead of one. Look, before, when we had a model, we didn't have this expression, right? And over here, we didn't have this expression. Over here, we didn't have this, and over here, we didn't have this. And look, those expressions over here are actually suggesting to us that what happens on the other market actually influences what happens on the first one. Because imagine what happens in this case. Let's just say the price of good 2 for some reason goes up. Now, what will happen over here? Well, depends on the value of the parameter A2, demand for good 1 will either go up or it will go down. And the same is true for the supply. And, look, and of course, by the same token, if the price of good 1 will change, will go up, let's just say, then Demand for group one can either increase depending on the volume of the parameter, and the same goes strong for supply. But this is not the end of the story. Because look, if this tells us that if price for the group two changes, this will have impact on the price of group one. But if the price of good one changes, this will have an impact on the
on the price of good two, and this in turn on the price of good one, and this in turn on the price of good two, and this in turn in, on the price of good one. And of course, it goes on and goes on and goes on. Okay, so clearly, solution here is not as easy as before. Definitely, what cannot we do here? We cannot just take first three equations and solve them, and then take another three and solve them separately. That wouldn't be very wise because we ever look because we would end up in a situation like this. We would solve one set of equations, we would got one set of uh, prices and quantities, and from this we would get into a different one. And if we want to actually uh, uh, actually get the solution and avoid it, this issue. We need to solve all six of them at the same time. Okay, this tells us that in order to find the actual solutions here, the main thing to do is going to be uh, to condense the information coming from the entire model. Okay, but when I was telling you about these changes, impact of price of good two on, on demand on good one, and price of good one on demand on good two, this should actually ring a bell for you. Why? Because this is something you definitely think of in your microeconomics class, but maybe not in such uh, how to say strict mathematical fashion. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Look, let's just say that we have a situation like this. A2 is bigger than zero. What does it mean? Well, it means uh, it means that if price of good two goes up, then quantity demanded of good one goes up. How do we call goods that are characterized by this type of uh, a, 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 by this type of relationship, well, how about substitutes, right? If we talk about Pepsi and cola, we would imagine that if price of cola doubles, demand for Pepsi would rise, and vice versa. If price of of a Pepsi doubles. Price of demand for cola rises, right? So, what we see over here is that if A2 is positive, then we talk about substitutes. But look, we should be able to read exactly the same relationship from here. Because look, now we've got that if A2, A2, Alpha 1 is bigger than 0. This means that if price of good 1 goes up, quantity demanded of good 2 should also go up. Which makes, of course, perfect sense if the two goods are substitutes. Okay, and uh, uh, and uh, Look, in this particular case, we should notice that, of course, situation can be reversed. Because, look, we see clearly that if A2 and alpha 1 are bigger than 0, so they are positive, 
we will have substitutes. But there is one more thing we should mention. Look, if the sign of alpha 2 is positive, sign of alpha 1 should be positive as well. How do we write it? We write it as signum A2 equals to signum alpha 1. Okay, what is the signal function? I'm not sure. I, I think we haven't covered signal function in mathematics, so let me just uh, uh, let, let me just explain it. Signal x y equals signal x uh, it, it is the function that works. Oh, let's works like this. Is equal to one if x is bigger than one to zero if x is equal to zero and to negative one if x is smaller than two. So look, if you see something like that, it's like a fancy way of saying that the signs of those two parameters must be the same. Okay, now, so what would happen now if we would have the opposite situation? So, what if those parameters would be both negative? Because definitely they need to be have the same sign. Doesn't matter what. And look, of course, if they now have a, uh, uh, if they now would be both negative, then increase in price of good two would mean a fall in price and in quantity demanded of good one. An increase in the price of good one would mean a fall in quantity demanded of good two. How do we call such goods? Those goods are, of course, complements. What are the examples of such goods? You can think about sugar and coffee that you probably heard in uh, your microeconomics class because this is the most commonly used example. If price of sugar goes up, people buy or drink less coffee. Uh, uh, but I think for now, like you can imagine that if software uh, for uh, for a specific type of a of a of a computer goes up, people buy more of the other computer of, of the uh, 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 of the competition's computer. So. In this case, we would say that complementing consumption is software and computers that are compatible with each other, like apps for iOS and apps for Windows, uh, would be complements. And Windows and uh, iOS are, of course, in this scenario, uh, uh, substitutes. Okay, so we still must have a situation that the signs of those two parameters are exactly the same. However, uh, 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 however, uh, we know that the sign cannot be predetermined. Like we cannot say for sure, like with those, that those need to be like that because law of demand and law of supply says that. In this case, depending whether the two goods are complements or substitutes. The situation is going to be different. And of course, there is a thick and third possibility. What if those are both equal to zero? Then we say that those goods are unrelated and then increasing price of good two has no impact on quantity demanded 
for good, good, uh, uh, for good one. And increasing the price of good one has no impact on quantity demanded of good two. Okay. So look, now we've dealt with parameter uh, uh, with parameter a two and alpha two. So the only thing left is parameter b two and beta two. And look again. Uh, those two will be representing uh, uh, will be representing the relationship of substitution of, uh, or or a complement uh, substitutability and complementarity. <coughs> However, this time we are talking about supply and production, right? Okay, so let's again see what 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 means. Okay, okay. So let's just say that B two, right, which is partial derivative, of course, of Q S one with respect to B two. Yeah, and let's just say that it is positive, right, and at the same time. Uh, it, 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 at the same time, beta 1, of course, also needs to be positive. Again, we need to maintain the same assumption that signal beta uh, b2 is equal to signal beta 1. Okay, and now let's see what this implies to us. Now, if price of good 2 goes up, demand for good, uh, uh, if price of good 2 goes up, demand, uh, I'm sorry, supply of good 1 goes up, right? Because this parameter is positive. And the same here, if price of good 1 goes up, Quantity supply uh, of good two goes up. So what can we say? Mm, uh, what can we say about situation like this? Look, let's think about it. Uh, uh, mm, uh, let's uh, let's think about it uh, for for a second. We've got a situation where price of good two goes up and now we want to produce more of good one hmm the price of good two goes up we want to produce more of good one where could we see a situation like this imagine that you've got a wood chunk so this is a place where you take trees and trees are turned into desks. And let's just say that our woodchuck produces desks. However, look, when you take a tree and you cut it down with a saw, you get desks. But as a byproduct, you get also a sawdust. Sawdust is all those things, all these tiny parts of a, of a tree that you get when you cut a tree into desks. Can we do something with it? Well, of course we can. For example, we can pack it up and we can uh, sell it to people who have hamsters because they want to put sawdust on the bottom of the aquarium where the hamster or a guinea pig lives. And so it can poop in it and do other things that guinea pigs and hamsters like to do. Uh, 
So, we see that there is a relationship between those two types of goods. Like, we see that one actually is byproduct of the other. Look, those two types of goods we call complements. But we usually when you were talking in microeconomics by complement, you were talking about complements in consumption. Here they are complements in production. So one is produced along with the other. Uh, the other example of this is when oil is turned into petroleum, byproduct is sulfur. Right? And look, now I think this should get clear to you. Look, if the price of sawdust goes up, we would like to produce more of desks. But also, if price of desks goes up, we should want to produce more of sawdust. Right? So those two goods are complements in production. Okay, so now let's take it. So now I hope you can see where this is going now. What if those two parameters are negative? Well, in this case, of course, the direction of the relationship changes. And now, how can we think about it like this? Look, look, okay, of course, I assume that you can guess that if price of good 2 goes up, quantity supply of good 1 goes down. So, probably you can guess that those two are substitutes. But what, are, what actually are the substitutes in production? Look, substitutes in terms of production are goods that you can produce with the same factors of production. And look, let me again use a very simple example. Uh, uh, use a very simple example to explain how does this is all going to work. Look, imagine uh, that you have a carpenter store or car carpenter shop. Carpenter is a person that produces furniture, right? And let's just say that this carpenter produces two types of goods. Those are chairs and tables. Okay, now look. Can the carpenter produce chairs and tables using the same equipment? Well, yeah, he needs wood, he needs tools, plus, you know, his skill. Now, look, and imagine like something like this, that if the price of chairs goes up, like let's just say that he produces tables, but the price of chairs goes up, what should he do? Probably, if the price of chairs are rising for some reason, uh, he should stop producing as many table, tables and start producing more chairs, right? And in the same, by the same token, uh, in, by the same token, uh, if the if the price of tables are going up, he should produce less chairs or tables to make more money. Look again, this is a very very simple but intuitive example. But you can think like if you have a car company and you see that the demand and, and accordingly the price of a specific model that you are producing is going up, you probably should produce more of this model than other models, right? And uh, of course, Ceteris is fighting with other things being equal. So you still can produce those cars, both of these cars, using the same equipment, the same components, the same workers, but because one is becoming relatively more expensive, it is probably better to concentrate on production of the one on which you can make more money. Okay, and finally, uh, finally, uh, 
Uh, and then finally, we also can have a situation in which those two, uh, and those two goods, and those two parameters are equal to zero. And again, we would have a situation when the goods are unrelated. Okay, so I think at this moment we know everything we need to know about this model, its structure, and probably at this moment the complexity of this model might terrify you a little bit. But in the next video, we're gonna learn how to solve it. And if you know appropriate trick, it turns out that solving this model is not that complicated. So thank you for your attention and see you in the next video.